tech's crazy here if you mute or unmute. Um, so uh, John, Ron is going to present the entrepreneurial artist, John James Audubon in the Lowcountry. Ron is former director and CEO of the Reading Public Museum in Reading, Pennsylvania, and director of the Nebraska Museum of Art uh, of the University of Nebraska. During his career, he curated two exhibitions on the art and life of John James Audubon, which makes him um, quite knowledgeable about the man himself. So um, without further ado, I'm going to mute. All right. Yourself. Okay. You're good. All right. Um, stop share. Okay. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, I do want to thank the Port Royal Foundation for this opportunity and especially want to thank them for the great work that they're doing in conserving our low country environment. So about 20 years ago or so, um, I was director of a wonderful museum in central Nebraska called the Museum of Nebraska Art. It's located in central Nebraska in a town named Kearney. And Kearney is ground zero for one of the most amazing migrations of birds on the planet, the Sand Hills Cranes, uh, which you see here picture. And, okay. All right, press on that. Good. Yeah. Okay. So um, at any rate, here in, in, in Kearney, um, it was uh, one of the great um, places actually on the planet for migration of the sandhills cranes. And throughout the course of the month of May, about a half a million sandhills cranes um, would migrate through the area. And they would take up temporary residence on farm fields, uh, very rich in the remains of corn from the last autumn's harvest. And the sight and sound of them, it was, was quite extraordinary. Um, you see here, they're, they're a pretty sizable animal. They can be as large as three feet tall, um, three feet, four feet tall, and a wingspan of, of about um, three feet. And it is an amazing sight. So I was a new director um, of the museum and I inquired, was there, uh, did the museum have a, a print um, of this that could be exhibited? And specifically, what about John James Audubon? And I was amazed to learn that there was no print of the Santa Hills Crane. So I made it one of my first official um, projects is to find a, a print of the Santa Hills Crane. Now, I was new to Audubon, uh, so I did my research and I found that there was a great print by Audubon that you see here, uh, standing in front of the sand hills of central Nebraska. Um, found out that there was a dealer in Chicago that actually had one of these prints, which by the way, are very large. It's a two foot by three foot print. Um, they did happen to have one from the original 1838 edition. So my wife and I, Pat, got on a plane, went to Chicago to the Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer um, Gallery, took a look at it, and they said, this can be yours, uh, Mr. Roth. And it was in the five-figure range. Um, in today's market, it's probably a print that's in the six-figure range. So I was fortunate to have some museum angels. I called them, and within about an hour, we could raise the money for this print. And you can see it uh, to this day at the Museum of Nebraska Art. Now, this is the front page of the Wall Street Journal. It was an article at the journal in December of 2010 on an auction of one of the rare remaining intact sets of the Birds of America. This set sold at auction for over $11 million. This was the most expensive price paid for a book ever. And so I want you to look at that photo below and you can see these are huge books. These are not just a regular book, they're the size of a Kindle. Uh, they're about two foot by three foot and they're bound in leather. So I guess the question is, uh, it's a natural question, what's all the fuss? What's the big deal about Audubon? Well, John James Audubon is one of the towering figures of American art. His life's work, The Birds of America, includes portraits, from nature of over a thousand birds representing 435 species in their typical habitats. 
He took 18 years to complete his masterwork from 1820 to 1838. His travels took him from the shores of Labrador, uh, the islands of Key West, the marshlands of the South Carolina Low Country, and many places in between. By the time of his death in 1851, he had single-handedly transformed the depiction of wildlife from lifeless and pedestrian images of birds to something the world had never seen before. This gentleman is a man named Alexander Wilson. Now, he was a Scottish artist who immigrated to America and published his ornithology of American birds just prior to Audubon. And his work represented some of the best ornithological work until Audubon came along. And let's take a look at one of his prints. This is how he depicted um, a, a species, several species of herons. Uh, the large one would be a black crowned heron. And as we look at it, um, they're certainly nice, handsome pieces, but they're rather static, um, kind of wooden views of birds viewed strictly in profile. Um, they have a very limited color palette. And, you know, frankly, they, they seem kind of stiff and unnatural. So that's how Wilson depicted a heron. And this is how Audubon depicted it. This is the little blue heron he did here in the Low Country. And you see here the amazing illusion of depth that he provides. It's almost as if Audubon has given us a 3D glasses and we're viewing everything in the round. Uh, you have the lushly rendered detailed sweep of the landscape in the background that creates an illusion of distance. You have a kind of sparkling photographic realism of the picture. You know, and the viewer has a sense of being there in that landscape with that bird. And there's also the uncanny accuracy and delicacy and virtuosity of his renderings of the bird's feathering. You know, we're, we're up close and personal with the bird. It's a sensate being that we, that we care about. And this was his rendering of the red-tailed hawk, which you see around here. Um, in, in Audubon, there's drama, there's excitement, a story is being told. It, it's almost cinematic in the way it captures the birds in action. And we experience through the visual image something of their power and their speed as birds. The other thing about Audubon that was quite unique and different was in a meticulous attention to anatomical detail. And I ask you to look closely at the, the feathering here. The translucent translucent tail feathers of the, of the male hawk uh, uh, lit from behind, that's the hawk above. And then the subtle shadings of the female's tail feathers and the coat of the rabbit. Um, and Audubon was using art media in new ways to, to try to replicate the subtle effects of bird coloring and feathering. And he used all sorts of media in ways that were never done before. He used pastels, he used watercolors, he used oil paint, chalk, ink. He even used gold colored metallic prints um, and they may be used um, just in the same picture. He used them in different innovative ways, never done before to create this sense of realism that was different and distinct in wildlife art. The other thing um, that would be typical of um, one of uh, his portraits is that like here, you usually see an example of both the male and female species from different positions. Um, we also typically see the birds depicted from a bird's eye view, not humans. And based on his observations, we see a typical behavior of this bird that he tries to get across in its work. And here he's showing the courtship of the male hawk swooping down from above on the female. Uh, she rolls over in the air and exposes her claws in a kind of vain gesture of resistance. And then the two of them fly to a tree and they mate. But finally, and really most importantly, this is a compelling evocation of survival in the natural world. Audubon was actually born in Haiti. His father, Jean Audubon, was a captain in the French Navy and he lived in Nantes, France. Now, captain Audubon invested in a sugar plantation in Santo Domingue, uh, what we know today as Haiti. He had a mistress there named Jean Rabin, and in 1785, as a result of their liaison, there was born to them a child named Jean Rabin and who later changed his name to John James Audubon. Uh, it should be noted here that Audubon's legitimate birth was a continuing source of embarrassment to him throughout his life, and he went to great lengths to hide it. And I guess you could say that Audubon propounded two big lies during his lifetime. One of them, that he was a native born American, born in Louisiana, 
and the other one that he studied art with a, the famous French artist, Jacques-Louis David. There's no documented evidence that he studied with David in France, but uh, he did spend his childhood in France and spent the early years of his life growing up on his father's estate in France, and he received the education of a gentleman. Uh, this would include the study of languages, training and singing, dancing, playing the flute, violin, hunting, shooting, fencing, and riding. Uh, in short, he had a privileged upbringing. Now, he claimed that his father was the one who sparked his interest in birds, um, taking him on long walks and explaining their seasonal migrations and gave him a book of bird illustrations. And he later wrote in his journal, they soon became my playmates. I felt an intimacy with them bordering on frenzy. A new life ran in my veins and it gave me a desire to copy nature. Now, his father um, had a, an investment property in the United States that you see here. It was an estate just Northwest of Philadelphia in a small town called Mill Grove. Uh, it was said that Mill Grove had the potential for developing a tin mine. And in 1803, to protect his son from constriction, conscription into Napoleon's army, he sent his 19 year old son to Mill Grove to oversee the property. And Audubon spent the next four years of his life at Mill Grove. And during that time, several important things happened to him there. He did not discover tin, but he did discover Lucy Bakewell, one of the daughters of the Bakewell family who owned an estate adjoining Mill Grove and who would become his beloved wife and partner for the rest of his life. He was able to spend time on his passion for birds there in their study and improve his skills as an artist. And during that time, he made a discovery that would transform his art and the American bird art in general. Audubon was very frustrated by his inability to, to view a, a live bird up close, unless he was lucky enough in the rare moments when he could capture one. So he shot many birds, uh, but their lifeless carcasses laid on a table, and they really had none of the physical attributes necessary to, to create a, a lifelike portrait. So he had this epiphany one day. He said, what would he do if he, if he mounted the birds like a marionette, so to speak? Um, and so he, he found a, a piece of wood, he mounted some rather long, stiff nails on it, and he basically mounted um, a bir the birds on it in a position that he would typically see in the wild. And that way, he could observe the finest details of the bird's feathering and its physical attributes. And this is probably the one kind of um, moment in invention that you might say transformed American art, that he was able to really look carefully and closely to the feathering and all those physical attributes that were unique to the bird um, in flight. So um, he does marry Lucy in 1808. They leave for Louisville, Kentucky, where he opens a general merchandise store. In 1810, they move further down the river to Henderson, Kentucky to start another commercial enterprise. Now, Henderson is a paradise for hunting and birding. And in 1812, Audubon completes his first drawing of a bird in flight, and that would be the passenger pigeon that you see here. Now, the passenger pigeon is one of the tragedies of American wildlife, its extinction. Uh, during Audubon's lifetime, it's estimated that there were as many as a, a billion passenger pigeons in North, the North American continent. And in his portrait of the passenger pigeon, he does render an image that has a, a clearly affectionate and tone to it. They appear to be kissing as the male passes food to his mate. And he wrote about the passenger pigeon, the tenderness and affection displayed by these birds toward their mates are in the highest degree striking. And also in Henderson in 1813, Audubon witnessed one of the massive flocks of the passenger pigeons and their slaughter by Kentuckians on the banks of the Ohio shooting them. They were used as food. And as I said, they soon became extinct, never to be seen again. So the Audubons um, actually, led, they were young. Uh, they lived active and happy lives as part of the Henderson community. It was a frontier town, but troubles were on the horizon. The American economy was overheated with land speculation, easy credit. And in 1819, the bottom fell out of the economy with America's first Great Depression. Uh, for Audubon, it was a disaster. 
Uh, he found himself in debt for $25,000. That would, that would be close to a half a million dollars in today's dollars. Uh, his creditors had him arrested. He was thrown in jail. And he really was at the, the lowest depths of his life uh, in that jail, became uh, depressed. But he had the kind of character that was persistent and he wouldn't give up. And while he was jailed, he came up with his big idea, the birds of America, true life-size portraits of every known and unknown species of birds on the North American continent. When he got out of um, jail for a period of time, he had to make money and uh, he actually be, uh, gave art lessons. Um, he was a self-taught artist, artist, by the way. He never received that we know of a formal art lesson. But he had that, that genius, that brilliance that made him um, a great artist. And he used it as a way to train people and train some artists who, that actually accompanied him um, on his trips. So uh, on October 20th, or excuse me, October 12th, 1820, he set out on a flatboat like this with a talented art student of his called Joseph Mason to explore the territories along the Mississippi Basin and begin his quest to complete his big project, his big idea quest that would last him for the next 18 years. So he arrived in New Orleans on January 7th of 1821, and he began his first serious studies of birds. And this is one of his first drawings in his mature style. This is an immature brown pelican, which he produced in 1821. Uh, he's perched on a mangrove tree. <clears throat> and in it, you see some of his characteristics as an artist, the very deep, vivid coloring um, that he used using all those different art media that I mentioned to him. And also he was what I call the master of the curve. He would use the curve to organize his compositions. And so if you go to the tip of his beak and follow it down to the head and it curves around into the neck, into the body, it has a very nice, beautiful rhythm to it um, that uh, takes the eye across the body as we, as we view it. Now he painted more pelicans later in his career. Uh, this is one a little bit, a good bit later in 1832, uh, a mature pelican painted in the Florida Keys. And again, we note the, the beautiful flow of the curve. Um, we also note the blue in the water in the background is echoed in the blue of the bill. Um, this bird, by the way, has the biggest bill of any bird in the world uh, for scooping up fish, um, has great eyesight, and they can dive from as high as 50 feet um, to catch their prey. And this, like many birds in, in an earlier generation, nearly became extinct uh, due to DT, DDT contamination in, in the Atlantic and Pacific coastal waters where they breed. And in fact, in Louisiana, where they are st the state bird, um, for a period of time, the population was wiped out. Now, this was the summer of 1821, and he, was, he became employed by a woman named Lucretia Peary to tutor her 16-year-old daughter, on her Oakley plantation, which was about 125 miles upriver from New Orleans. And here he created one of his first truly great compositions. It's really one of his crowning achievements of the summer. And this is his drawing of the swallow-tailed hawk. And some of you in our region area might have seen some of these. I saw one recently just two months ago in our community where we live. Um, this hawk's graceful flight is, is legendary. It's beautiful streamlined rendering of the wings from above. He's really an elegant flying machine. And Audubon really deftly captures the, the aerodynamic physiology of the hawk. We also see the subtle gradations of the blacks to the blues on its back feathers. And also um, it's typical of them to feed on the wing as he has depicted here. Um, also, if you look closely at the head, uh, there's a lot of very fine detail. Um, to, um, there's shadowing that creates a sense of volume and, and three-dimensionality. There's the elegant rendering of the coils of the snake. And if you look really closely, you can even see the tiny hairs above its, above its beak and just below the eyes. It's an extraordinary work. Um, and um, like many of its kind of uh, birds, the hawks, um, it uh, fed on large insects, dragonflies, snakes, lizards, and frogs. And I'll ask, um, Chris to jump in here anytime he feels comfortable in terms of some of the ha uh, habits of these birds. Another of the great um, drawings he did during his time in Louisiana is this. This is called uh, the whooping crane. 
It's five feet tall. It's the largest wading bird and the tallest bird on the North American continent. In fact, it was so large, it didn't fit into the, the two foot by three foot frame of the paper. So he, he had it kind of um, bend over. And the composition is, is typical of the way he uses creativity. It might seem like a disadvantage for the bird to be tipped, uh, tipped over, but um, he, he makes note of the voracious appetite of the whooping crane. Uh, here we see the pincers of the beak, almost like scissors ready to decapitate its, its prey. And of course, he's always trying to bring in drama. Here we see the prostate galligator seeming to squeal for mercy and, and the claws cocked and ready to, to spear it. Um, it's a great piece. But of course, um, he felt very comfortable not only with some of the more unusual birds, but the common birds, um, for instance, like the boat-tailed grackle. Uh, here we see the grackle perched on a live oak um, replete with Spanish moss. And again, I want to make the mention here, it's important to note, Audubon did do probably most of the backgrounds um, uh, of his birds, but he employed a number of artists through the years who actually also did the backgrounds. And this background is by an artist, it was a student of his called George Lehman. Um, of course, the grackle uh, breeds on the Atlantic and Gulf Coast. We see a fair number of them around here. Uh, one thing we don't see so much around here is this bird. It's called Chuck Will's Widow. Again, uh, Audubon uh, drew this near Natchez, Louisiana. Um, and again, one of its most distinctive features is the large mouth. It's uh, fully two inches when it's fully spread. Uh, it's so large that it's been known to eat hummingbirds, uh, warblers, and sparrows, as well as the typical diet of insects. Um, here we see one depicted with the female's uh, mouth wide open. Um, it also depicts a scene that Audubon claims that he actually saw of a coral snake attacking some Chuck Will's widow. Um, it is definitely a tour de force in its depiction of feathering and textural subtleties. And I always ask people to take a moment and study these uh, and the detail of them. It's really quite extraordinary. And again, um, he has two different positions of them. We're looking from above um, at the male hawk, and then we're also getting a side view uh, of the female hawk uh, below him. Another smaller, delightful variety uh, that he depicted in uh, the uh, Louisiana era was the white-breasted nuthatch or tree mouse or the upside down bird. Uh, it's a distinctive bird because it is the only bird I believe that feeds on insects on tree trunks in this kind of unique upside down fashion. You see the, the one on the far left. And it's also clever that the way Audubon uses four different views of the bird, you know, to show its anatomy and from, from different perspectives. Um, the name, its name comes from the way it forces soft shelled nuts, things like chestnuts and acorns into tree crevices and hacks them open like a, like a hatchet. And again, the four different uh, positions of them. Again, I ask you to take a look at the, uh, the tree trunk. Um, the great attention to the detail um, is always part of the delight of looking at Audubon. A bird that um, we can see around here, it's rather rare. It's called the red-eyed vireo. Uh, we don't see many of them because they spend a lot of their time in the highest canopies of the woods. They're seen, but they're not seen typically, but they're definitely heard. Uh, they sing more persistently than any other bird. Um, they have very short punctuated phrases, as many as 60 to 80 per minute. Um, they eat lots of spiders, which is why the, the spider is depicted here in the upper left-hand corner. And again, always thinking about the art, we follow the arc of the bird's back, which leads directly to the eye, our eye to the spider. Uh, really enjoy the very delicate rendering of the web, almost like strings of a harp, and, and the beautiful rendering of the honey locust tree. Um, this was done by the artist uh, Joseph uh, Mason. And um, I have seen some vireos in this area occasionally for a number of years. My wife and I um, led the um, Christmas bird count in our community, and we did come across um, a vireo at one point. Uh, so they, they are around. This next um, bird is the yellow-billed cuckoo. Again, he did this in, in Louisiana. Um, they're known for the grace in the air, but a kind of awkwardness on the ground. Uh, he chose not to show them flying them, but actually perched in this pawpaw tree. 
um, a typical uh, habitat and again, beautiful rendering of the, the fruit of the pawpaw. Um, but the thing that I direct your attention to is that butterfly to the right there. Um, this is an ex extraordinary piece of, of artistry to depict that butterfly so flawlessly and accurately from the side. It's very difficult, uh, but he did it um, with great precision. Um, also, if you look at that leaf in the lower part, um, uh, the attention to detail of the uh, deteriorating leaf, all part of, I think, the, the joy of Audubon uh, and the kind of details that he would get into um, in his art. Here we're looking at one of his um, more famous uh, works. This is the Peregrine Falcon. And now this is interesting because um, he would often maybe start a work and then put it aside for a year or two and then come back to it. And that's what happened with this piece here. The female, which you see uh, on the left, was drawn um, in Louisiana in 1822. But the male on the right was drawn several years later. And again, remember I mentioned that he uses different kinds of mediums and techniques. Well, actually, what you're looking at with the male, and here's the female, this is actually a cutout. Um, he cut it out of, a, the, of the original paper that he painted it on and then glued it on top of the final composition that you see here. Um, you know, the falcon, the peregrine falcon, by the way, as I understand it, is one of the fastest hawks or fastest birds on earth. Um, it's been clocked up to speeds nearly 70 miles an hour, I believe. And when it dies for prey, it can reach speeds at nearly 200 miles an hour. It's an amazing flying machine. Again, unfortunately, unfortunately like so many birds um, in the 1960s, DDT limited its ability to breed in its traditional breeding areas. And indeed, it was the first bird to be placed on the US, United States rare and endangered species list. I look at this uh, picture of a Northern bobwhite and red-shouldered hawk, and I think lights, camera, action. It's very cinematic. And one of the most cinematic of Audubon's pictures There's a lot of movement. And basically what we see here is a, um, a red-shouldered hawk attacking a cubby of Bob Whites. Um, the Northern Bob White red-shouldered hawk um, take the role of predator and prey. And Bob Whites, by the way, in Audubon's time were, were, were quite common, much more common than today. Now, Audubon observed that they roost in a circle with their heads facing outward, like you see here. And when a covey of Bob Whites is surprised by a predator like the hawk, they disperse in different directions to try to confuse a predator um, and then become separated. Um, I look at this hawk and I, I, call, I call it, you know, the, the, uh, the angel of death. And you see this fearsome claw of the hawk above, uh, above the really helpless poor little um, bird, a Bob White um, beside it, or beneath it, excuse me. And here you can see it. And what a tour de force of art that you see here. Again, he's used backlighting as an effective way to kind of shine through the, the feathering. And you can see the beautiful kind of amber colors of the wing, the highlights. Um, you also see it tr the, 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 uh, from the side and uh, the wing from the main wings from the side and the top very cleverly the way he does it. And you see those two fearsome claws uh, coming up. Uh, but also, as we look closer at the Bob Whites, a um, beautiful rendering, and you can really see with, with great detail the, the beautiful feathering, the reddish brown coloring um, of the female, and the beautiful blue tail feathers of the male. It's really an exquisite uh, work of art, very exciting. And I'll just back up a little bit to take one more look at it. One of the great, great pieces of American art. Okay, so um, I want to um, close his time um, in Louisiana with this bird. Some of you may recognize this. This is called the Carolina parakeet. Um, he did this in 1825, and unfortunately, on February 21st, 1918, 
the last known Carolina, Carolina parakeet in captivity died, and the species became officially extinct. I mean, it was slaughtered for sport, for food, and most notably, its feathers were used for women's hats. Uh, farmers viewed them as pests. Uh, they fed on their crops in the grain stores, and the farmers killed them in, in great numbers. But it's a delightful composition, and I really feel that his rendering of the uh, the, par the Carolina parakeet communicates the kind of playful, intelligent, flamboyant personality of the parakeet. Um, and also, if we look at them, the one on the lower right, you can see, again, the, the very exquisite way he enables us to see the feathering both from the side and from the top, just in one bird. And again, you look closely at the face and he seems to have a personality kind of looking out at us kind of aggressively. Another view that we see um, from the top, um, this kind of foreshortening, of course, is what he was exquisite. You can probably see here, he used actually some chalk in the original drawing. Um, and it's a very fine piece. By the way, um, if any of you get to New York City, the New York um, Museum of Natural History um, has a great collection of uh, original prints by Audubon. And you can see them uh, usually at any time if, if you ever visit there. Okay. So right now, um, we're leaving him in 1824. Um, he's in Louisiana. Uh, he has a portfolio now of over 200 completed paintings. So it's now time to get them published, to make some money from this. And, and in 1824, the place that he would have to go was Philadelphia. Now, Philadelphia was the hub of the United States intellectual and cultural life. And also, importantly, it had the only printers and engravers who might undertake this massive project. So um, he bought a new suit, he cut his hair to shoulder length, and as he describes himself, he dressed himself with extreme neatness. An old friend from his days in Mill Grove, a physician named James Meese, who was a well-connected connected Philadelphia resident, he agreed to introduce Audubon to some influential Philadelphians that he knew. Unfortunately, the, the Philadelphia connection really didn't work out for him for a variety of reasons. Um, but the most important was he really couldn't find a printer who was willing to undertake such a massive project. So discouraged again, he decides to go to Europe uh, to try his fortunes there. And on July 21st of 1826, Audubon left the United States for Liverpool to try his fortunes in England. Now, when he arrives, he had some letters of introduction, including some one from Thomas Jefferson. And one of Liverpool's leading intellectuals, William Roscoe, introduced him to F.J. Martin, who was the secretary of the Liverpool Royal Scientific Institution. And this is where Audubon got his first breakthrough. They, have, they held an exhibit of his work for the members of the institution, and the show was a sensation, a smashing success. People could not believe their eyes when they saw this remarkable work. So um, he began to establish a reputation, but even as important, he found a printer. He found a Scottish printer in Edinburgh, Scotland, that was willing to undertake the massive project of um, printing these large two by three foot prints. And again, I want to underline this audacious plan that he had. His goal was to produce the largest prints yet made with page sizes two feet by three feet, true life-size portraits. Ever the marketer, he called it the double elephant um, edition. And they would be sold to subscribers in numbers. In other words, each number would be sent to them and it would include five of these oversized prints or plates and each number would cost about two British pounds payable on delivery. And what you're looking at here is one of the original uh, tin line shipping containers um, that carried these and were delivered directly um, uh, to uh, the subscribers. And many of these subscribers were organizations. Actually, the state of South Carolina bought one, and it is actually available for view in the uh, University of South Carolina um, library. So. Ultimately, when it was all done, um, it was called the Birds of America, and it would include 435 plates in total, and they were bound in four large volumes. So they would receive the plates and they would put them, um, add them to the, these bound leather volumes. It was a massive project in terms of time, 
Uh, he uh, worked on this project from 1826 to its completion in 1838. So with the publication of these first numbers and the acceptance of Europe's scientific elite, Audubon's fame and his celebrity grew rapidly in the United States and he returned to the United States triumphant. Now, throughout this period, when he returned to the United States, he was constantly traveling, drawing birds, seeking new locations, both known and unknown species to add to the birds of America. And in the fall of 1831, Audubon decided to, uh, to make an extended excursion south that would take him through the Carolinas, Florida, and the Florida Keys. And he was accompanied by the artist, George Lehman, who would be painting the backgrounds, and the taxidermist. And his plan was to follow the fall migrations over the Eastern seaboard. Um, Audubon would draw the birds, Lehman would draw the backgrounds, and the taxidermist would prepare specimens for shipping back to European institutions. This was kind of a, a side business that um, Audubon had um, to keep some cash flow coming in. When he arrived uh, in Charleston, he was introduced to this man, the Reverend John Bachman, who was the pastor of St. John's Lutheran Church. Now Bachman was a passionate and gifted um, naturalist and Bachman's meeting with Audubon on the streets of Charleston began a lifelong friendship and then an artistic and scientific collaboration and the resulted even in very close family ties. Uh, Bachman's daughters would marry Audubon's sons. Bachman's second wife, Maria, was a gifted painter in her own right. And she painted the backgrounds of approximately 26 of Audubon's pictures uh, done in Charleston. And given Audubon's international reputation and stature as an ornithologist and an artist, Bachman probably could, would have viewed their chance meeting on the streets of Charleston as nothing short of miraculous. Indeed, Audubon wrote later that Bachman literally leaped from his saddle and gave me his hand with a pressure of cordiality that electrified me. So, Bachman immediately invited Audubon to stay with him at his home uh, on Pinckney Street. And Bachman devoted two days a week, on Mondays and Tuesdays, to helping Audubon. And Charleston um, society feted their famous visitor. There were dinner parties. A local physician gave him a Newfoundland dog he named Plato. Um, there was a, another person who donated an extensive, valuable collection of shells, and, and others kept him supplied in his favorite vice of snuff. So while in Charleston, um, Audubon made several ex excursions to nearby islands, including Sullivan's Island and Cole's Island. And the work that he did in the Charleston region, in my opinion, is among the greatest of his career. One of his first um, uh, subjects was this bird, the long-billed curlew, and you can see Charleston in the background to the left there. The curlew's genus name, new moon, is from the Greek word and refers to the curve of the bird's beak, which can often reach a length of seven inches. And studying the curlew's habits was one of the delights of Audubon's visit to Charleston, and, and he wrote in his journal, it was my good fortune to witness their arrivals and departures in the company of my good friend Bachman. The curlew spends the day in the sea marshes from which it returns at the approach of night to the sandy beaches of the seashores where it rests until dawn. As the sun sinks below the horizon, the curlews rise from their feeding grounds and in the course of an hour or so, the number of birds that collect in the, the, uh, in the place selected for their nightly retreat sometimes amounts to several thousand. Another bird that he saw there is a beautiful exotic black crowned night heron that you see here. And again, what would be typical, um, he not only would sometimes show the male and the female, but on occasion, like in this print, he shows a young um, uh, version of the bird. Um, this young night heron that you see in the back um, on the right, is just a few months old. It has that kind of odd vacant stare. But on the left, we see the, um, an adult night heron at the age of three. Um, he's gonna be feeding on some, you know, typically on selfish, uh, snakes, even mice and frogs. And again, we mentioned the artist George Lehman that does the backgrounds and he does this beautiful version of uh, Zephyr Lily that you see in the background. 
Um, the bird, the night heron, is not necessarily exclusively nocturnal, as the name implies, but it, it does feed chiefly during the evening and darker hours. And in Audubon's day, the plantation owners actively hunted these for their in sport. Um, they liked the delicacy of its flesh. Another um, Sullivan's Island um, bird that he saw was the common snipe. And the snipe, he noted, was best known for several of, the, of its habits. It had an airborne courtship display that includes a kind of tremulous winnowing sound and the vibration of two outer tail feathers at an altitude barely perceptible to the naked eye. And then uh, it has a, an erratic defensive zigzag pattern of its flight when it's, when it's flushed out of its hiding. Um, and like you see here on the two on the ground, uh, lower part of the picture, it has a behavior of crouching and freezing at the approach of danger. Um, and also its plumage makes it virtually in, invisible in the background of the marshes where it feeds. Uh, in addition, the eyes you might note are sufficiently to the rear of um, the birds so they can see both forward and backward. Now it feeds itself by inserting its long deep bill into the mud to probe for worms, snails, and insect larvae. And also again, uh, there's a low country scene in the background. You can see a plantation house there in the background uh, to the right. Another marvelous bird, uh, which he spent some time looking at, is the American bittern. Its yellowish brown plumage makes it really almost invisible in the background of the marsh. Um, again, uh, it freezes at the sign of danger. Um, and again, too, it, 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 um, it, when it's hunting, it will stand completely still. And when it sights its prey, it moves extremely slowly and at the last moment thrusts its bill down to make its catch. It does feed on, feed on frogs and snakes, crayfish, mice, moles, shrews, insects. Um, and again, um, it, like many of, uh, like the uh, bittern, um, it has this habit of standing exactly dead still, porting its bill upward to blend in with the tall, dark water plants when it senses danger. Uh, these birds can get somewhat large. Um, they can get to two to three foot high with a four foot wing spread. Um, you'd think they would be hard to miss, but they're, they're rarely sighted. Um, they're most active at dusk and at night, and they have stealthy behaviors and dark plumage that makes them especially hard to sight. One of the birds, of course, that we see here quite commonly are the great egret. An egret loves crayfish. Audubon pictures this egret here next to one of uh, the, um, the uh, crayfish mud chimneys. Again, because of its large size, um, you can get as, as, um, as, as extended as five foot, um, too big to fit um, the page. He has it crouched down as it prepares to, long, to lunge for its prey. Um, the Great Eager, as many of you know, can be seen in a wide area from Texas to Florida, the Great Lakes, Maine, and Canada. It's a beautiful bird. There's one thing I wanna point out to you though that speaks to his virtuosity as an artist. If you look to the right of this picture, you can see this very delicate, um, uh, feathering that you see. I'll get a close-up of it here for you. This is really quite extraordinary. Keep in mind, this is a painting. And so he has to paint each of these lines of the feathering individually. And he cannot make a mistake because if he does, it will ruin the whole picture. And so he had great sureness and confidence as an artist. Um, this is really an extraordinary example of virtuosity of, of Audubon. I mentioned his friend and mentor, Bachman. Uh, this is actually Bachman's warbler, a smaller bird. This species, species was found by, in 1830, excuse me, 1833 by Bachman, who collected the first specimen, and Audubon named it not of his friend. Now, Audubon never saw the bird in life, and he painted it from specimens that ba Bachman collected and gave to him. Again, the background was painted by Bachman's wife, Maria Martin. And she indeed did, indeed did some of the most exquisite backgrounds uh, for um, Audubon's work. By the way, it's perched on a bush named Frank Linnea. Frank Linnea was discovered in 18, 1765 in the South by the botanists William and John Bartram, that may be known to some of you, naturalists. And it was named in honor of Benjamin Franklin. And the bird um, was close to extinction, um, but I do believe that it still exists in the wild. One of the common sites that we see here in the low country is the chickadee. And here we see several 
uh, varieties of the chickadee, the black capped chickadee, the chestnut hackback chickadee, and the bush tip. Um, all these three species are related and they're members of the titmouse family. Um, Audubon posed these birds as though they were kind of in an animated drawing of a single individual changing positions. Um, by the way, they're voracious eaters. Uh, chickadees and bush tits support themselves with their strong feet. Uh, they're able to twist them into innumerable positions to the best bees, twigs, and cones, and trunk bark of many injurious insects like tent cater caterpillars and weevils. Chickadees are quite unique in that they can change direction quickly at 300th of a second, to be specific, and their hearts beat fast, about 800 times per minute compared to 80 times for a human. The background is painted by Maria Martin. Uh, and again, I love this particularly because of the nest that she depicts. Uh, you can see it from the top down. Uh, he, the, the birds will, will birds will bind the rim of kind of soft lichens and mosses at the top and uh, bind it to twigs. And they'll take anything, spider webs, leaves, flowers, and even feathers to make their unique looking um, nest. Also here um, in the low country, um, woodpeckers. Here we see his depiction of uh, several varieties, a red, excuse me, a red-bellied woodpecker, a northern flicker, yellow-bellied sapsucker, Lewis woodpecker, and hairy woodpecker. Now, again, there are quite a few versions here. Uh, toward the end of his, of his art, uh, artistry, you know, he began to put several varieties on one um, print um, just for the, uh, for the practical reasons of being able to save some time. Now, I might mention here too, that the upper four birds that you see in the composition, they were painted rather early in 1822, but he didn't get back to this painting until 1836 in Charleston. And um, Audubon centered his composition around the two largest birds in the group that you see in the middle. You saw them in Charleston, as I said. There's a male flicker in the middle right and the female flicker on the middle left. Again, he's always attentive to their behaviors, uh, woodpeckers use their strong pointed bills during courtship to establish territory uh, and attract um, a mate through repeated loud drumming on a hard surface and to chisel into the bark of trees in order to feed or ex uh, excavate nesting holes. Now, there's a nice detail you can see in the upper right of the um, composition. Um, here we see uh, the male red-bellied um, um, variety. Um, Audubon illustrates the long, thin tongue, which woodpeckers can extend quickly to feed. And they employ the barbed end and the sticky saliva coating to gather the insects and grubs. Again, I recommend you look at the feathering, you know, really wonderful level of detail that you see here. Certainly one of the most spectacular birds in our region and south end of the Florida is this bird, the roseate spoonbill. Now, after his stay in Charleston, Audubon continued to travel south um, through Florida and the Florida Keys. And um, he saw spoonbills. Um, the roseate spoonbill is the only spoonbill in the Western Hemisphere and the only pink spoonbill in the world. Uh, he saw a number of flocks of spoonbills. They love to wheel in the sunlight. And he wrote very exuberantly about the flowing color of their plumage. And um, they turn out that the roseates are also very gregarious. Um, they often associate with different species of herons. Um, Audubon noted um, that this particular spoonbill is about to wade into the water to search for the little fish, um, crustaceans, mollusks, and aquatic insects whose habitat it shares. And then he, if you look at that large bill that you see there, um, he takes that bill and moves it back and forth quickly into the water from side to side in wide arcs. Um, sometimes he'll immerse its entire head and the nerve endings of the bill and tongue sense the presence of living prey and signal the bill to snap shut and trap the food. This next is one of my favorite um, works of his. Here we go. Oh, sorry. This is the osprey uh, in Audubon, Audubon stay. It was called the fish hawk. And we see, of course, quite a few of these in the low country. And when it feeds, it will fly over fresh water or salt water. It pauses in midair, it hovers, it dangles its legs, and then it plunges into the water, feet and head first. Um, sometimes it disappears entirely below the surface. And Audubon described what happens in his journal. 
He says, on rising with its prey, it is seen holding it in the manner represented in this plate. It mounts a few yards into the air, squeezes the fish with its talons, and immediately proceeds towards its nest to feed its young or to a tree to devour the fruit of its industry in peace. The fish hawk has a great attachment to the tree to which it carries its prey and will not abandon it unless frequently disturbed. After the bird has risen with its catch, it positions the fish facing forward to reduce the wind resistance during its flight as it flays forward. Um, they weigh about four or five pounds and have been known to catch and carry a fish of about their own weight. It's a magnificent composition, isn't it? And um, here's a photograph I took of a fish hawk over our community some time ago. Give you an idea of what it looks like in flight. Another bird we see quite commonly here is the eastern bluebird. Uh, this was a, a drawing um, that um, inspired a lot of affection um, from Audubon. He, he found them, um, he found a very affectionate attitude toward them and he wrote uh, about them, it adds to the delight imparted by spring and enlivens the dull days of winter, full of innocent vivacity, warbling its ever pleasing notes and familiar as any bird can be in its natural freedom, it is one of the most agreeable of our feathered favorites. Uh, bluebirds were considerably more numerous in Audubon's day. Um, they did have a decline in population uh, as a result of several factors. Um, there was an introduction to the United States of the common European house sparrow in 1851, and then a starling later in the 1890s, and they competed um, with the bluebirds for nesting sites. Uh, there was also later on chemical spraying of trees, um, and they did a decline, but they've come back strongly in recent decades. Um, uh, we introduced bluebird boxes. Um, many of our communities here, and including my community, have put out bluebird boxes, and um, their populations are very substantial here in the Low Country. Another uh, bird you'll see commonly here in the Low Country is this. This is the Anhinga, or commonly called the snake bird. Very elegant composition. Um, just prior to breeding, and Hing is engaged in what's referred to as peering around, as you see here, the slow turning of their heads to the right and to the left, and the distinctive S-shaped curve uh, in the neck is a result of a very unique structure of, um, a of the eighth and ninth vertebrae, which combined with a specialized musculature allows the bird to, to, to dart its neck out quickly while swimming underwater to spear a fish. In its long pointed bill, um, I seem to have gone out here in my monitor, Chris. Oh, I'm back again, sorry. I'm back again, sorry about that. Uh, in closing, I just wanted to give a couple of the varieties that you do see here, somewhat more rarely, but um, I think we'll give you an idea of some of um, his artistic uh, virtuosity. Uh, this is the whippoorwill. Again, what's really special about this print is the feathering that you see both from above and below on uh, the beautiful rendering of the bark uh, on the limb. And as we get close, we see this really marvelous feathering um, of the whipper wolf from above. And also that moth and the designs and patterns that you see here that he has depicted. One of my favorite lighthearted uh, works by him is the yellow-breasted chap. This is one of his most joyous compositions. Um, he's depicting here the, the courtship display um, and um, especially want to direct your attention to the nest and the beautiful depiction of the roses around the nest. Um, here, this fellow here, I can't think of a happier guy than this one. Um, and it, it really communicates a sense of joy about these birds um, and a beautiful feeling of delight. This is the gray jay. Uh, here, here, there's a lot of beautiful fall colors that he included here. He's perched on a white oak branch. Um, they're usually breed in forests and spruce forests. Um, he depicted them in the woodlands uh, to enhance their plumage against the fall colors. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's a very nice detail. This is the brown thrasher. Um, great composition. Audubon actually claimed to have witnessed this battle between a black snake and brown thrashers that you see. Uh, it ended happily, according to Audubon. The, the thrather, thr thrashers eventually killed the snake. And Audubon claims to have played a role himself in this drama. If you look closely at the bottom, right next to the, to the nest, um, you can see um, the 
female whose energy is flagging and she seems like she's passed out. And actually, Audubon claims to have taken her and held her for a few minutes until she revived. Again, uh, we see from different vantage points, this bird, a very haunting macabre image of the, um, the black vulture, very poignant. Um, given the, the vulture's heat feeding habits, it was natural that Audubon would depict the birds with carrion. Um, he often um, described how hunters would shoot and dress a deer and then leave the less desirable parts for vultures. It's also a famous image of the golden eagle. Um, he was able actually to capture one and have it um, um, in captivity so we could get a close look at it. And also there in the lower left-hand corner, you see a man uh, on a dangerous um, mission here. He's on a trunk of a tree out in the middle of the wild, clawing his way over the trunk. Well, this is a self-image. This is the only image we self-portrait we know the Audubon made of himself. And it shows him typically, he had a bit of an ego. Um, he exaggerated a lot. So here you see the great man uh, dig, making this dangerous trek across um, uh, the mountains. And finally, I close with um, the image of the Atlantic Puffin. Again, his travels on the East Coast from Charleston and uh, South uh, ended up going north to Labrador. Um, and um, in 1833, um, he did go to Labrador to get some additional birds for his final work on the birds of America. He was especially interested in depicting the nest of the Atlantic puffin. Uh, they do nest, nest in large groups and they build burrows several feet long in the loose soil of, of the turf covered slopes or on the tops of cliffs. Um, the male does most of the digging, uses his bill to break up the earth and his feet and sharp claws to excavate it. Uh, they use grass, seaweed, feathers to line the back of the burrow, and the, there the eggs usually lay on egg. And that is the end of my formal presentation. Um, I hope you've had an opportunity to get a little bit better idea of the, of the birds of our low country area. And I guess at this point, Chris, maybe we can answer some questions if there are any out there. Yeah. Uh, thank you all so much. I'm gonna speak through Ron's computer so we don't have feedback going back and forth. I hope everyone can hear me just fine. Um, yeah, if anybody has any questions, you can direct them to the time Q&A. Ron, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, I will say, I definitely think that Audubon was, uh, may, may have exaggerated a bit, right, from some <laughs> yes. of his images. Um, the one <laughs> mainly that caught my attention was the coral snake on the whipper, on the tree, right? So typically coral snakes are fossorial, um, completely live most of their life underground. Our ground snake would be pretty rare to see one in a tree, right? Not to say it's impossible, right? Because um, yeah. nature does its own thing, but... Um, well, you bring up an interesting point because he was known to exaggerate. He was always looking for the story. You know, he was almost like a, a Hollywood producer. And so he would tend to exaggerate things and and perhaps uh, brush uh, on the truth. Um, so um, one of the things he was actually criticized for as an ornithologist was his tendency to humanize birds. It was a great criticism and one that still stands. He wanted drama. He wanted people, to, humans to relate to these birds. And so at times there's a little bit more of that and I think the professional ornithologist would be comfortable with. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have seen the, um, the long billed curlew uh, print of Charleston before recently, actually. Um, somebody was speaking um, that uh, right now it's actually uh, you, you don't see long billed curlews in Charleston anymore. Um, but, you know, according to Audubon, they were quite, quite abundant. Um, um, and I want to say that recently in past years, um, there have been sightings now along the coast near Charleston, uh, potentially due to efforts of preservation along the coastline really? with some islands. Um, but um, just one of those, um, I love seeing those those differences <laughs> in what he saw, like with the passenger pigeons and right. the curlews and what, you know, is just not existent in today's world. Yeah, and I, I might mention too that um, he was a prolific writer. Uh, he not only, uh, of course, did his drawings, 
but there are a number of volumes that he wrote that you that people can get um you can order through amazon of his journals and his journals are really quite fascinating because he gives you the backstory uh where when and what were the circumstances of seeing many of these birds has a lot of time in charleston and all of his activities up there and gives you um and he's a he's a very entertaining writer as well he's interesting he's an interesting read if you're really into ornithology and birds it's certainly worth a look oh well um no questions i think i mean you were very uh uh decisive and, and very complete in everything that you're saying so it's not really surprising that there wasn't much uh, uh questions there now if anybody has any questions, please just direct them to me. You can get my email off of our website. Um, and this this uh, will be this was recorded, so I will have it published on our YouTube channel um, in the in the coming weeks. So um, just thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Ron. That was wonderful. I loved it. Thank you, um, Chris. And uh, I hope everybody has a great day. Thanks so much. <laughs>